What's up guys, it's your girl Lady Pelvic of Pelvic Gaming and as promised, today we are talking about top 5 underrated gaming soundtracks excluding JRPGs. I'm excluding because the previous video was strictly JRPGs, so if you want to see that, check it out. Now I want to be clear, I'm addressing the underrated soundtrack, so that means the game itself doesn't have to be underrated. So when we think of great gaming OSTs excluding JRPGs, we think of Sonic, Jet Set Radio, Splatoon, Katamari, and Donkey Kong. But in this video, we're going to talk about games that don't get that musical recognition. Number five. Sonic's music is super well known. Even the more infamous Sonic games have super straight fire music. But what about the spin-off games? Or rather, what about the spin-off games that don't even have Sonic? Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. It's a westernized Puyo Puyo with a Dr. Robotnik skin, since Sega was poppin' at the time. Despite Sonic and friends being collectively absent, we still have heroes that rise to the occasion. Beans. Honestly, I felt kinda bad for Eggman afterwards. I mean, how does it feel to be an evil genius, only to experience being beaten by speedy animals and living bean creatures? Now, I'm gonna be honest, I can only really think of four solid underrated soundtracks that aren't JRPGs, so this isn't a throwaway, but it kind of is. Anywho, this soundtrack has nostalgia written all over it. The lead composers are Masanori Hikichi and Masayuki Nago, both also worked on other iconic Sonic games. This soundtrack is all about synths and energetic music, two things I adore. Genesis music in general has a special place in my heart. Now, there are only four distinct level soundtracks, three of which play throughout the four stages apiece. They're all good, even though the first and second stage themes are just the same song but at a higher tempo, which should be annoying on its own, but the gameplay gets fast-paced and chaotic, and the music matching the rising intensity every step of the way. And now, the sped up 80s aerobic edition. Act fast! For the low bar of 650 likes on this video before the end of July, Lady Pelvic will release a 5 minute video of aerobic dances to video game music. This is a great value. So act now. Lady Pelvic has no professional training as an aerobic instructor. Please don't try these moves at home. By following along, you have any right to sue Lady Pelvic for any injury you may incur while dancing. Number f, -f, -f -o. It's a shame that this game has been both remastered and remade for good reason, and people still forget these beautiful and epic sounding tracks. The music hits just as hard as these moving mountains do. Remastered for the PS3 and remade for the PS4. Shadow of the Colossus. There was no better composer suited to making music for vanquishing titanic foes than Ko Otani. Considering his work on Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, giant monsters all out attack, Gundam Wing, and Gundam Wing Endless Waltz, players were guaranteed to be mesmerized by the work he wove together for Shadow of the Colossus. I think a lot of people forget how incredible and epic this soundtrack is, primarily because you spend a lot of time trying to find colossi. There is faint music when traveling the grasslands or the desert, but I found myself primarily focusing on the sound of galloping hooves, rushing waters, and the winds at my back. It isn't until you eventually encounter the colossi that you're stolen from distraction. A frightening melody, heralding the player's impending doom. It feels like Wanderer, the protagonist, is praying that he survives the encounter. But it isn't merely enough to spot the beast, but to garner its attention. The melody rapidly changes into something grand and hopeful once Wanderer grabs hold of the stone menace. The entire mood shifts from eerie to rambunctious as you wrestle the beast to a swift death. Victory, figuratively and literally, just within reach. And after you strike the finishing blow, another rapid mood change as the music abruptly stops at the sound of Wanderer's Blade culling the Colossi into a sad and remorseful melody. In most games, after defeating a boss, the music praises our heroes with upbeat fanfare and triumphant drum beats, but not 
Shadow of the Colossus. As the mountain falls, the soft chanting of women echo through the battle zone. Funeral bells toll, soon followed by somber and mournful string instruments, as Wanderer is pierced with the darkness that leaked from the Colossi. As a whole, the remake's music of Shadow of the Colossus, a game with magnificent scale, is somehow overlooked when it comes to composition. I hope some of you, if you're not inspired to play the game, at least enjoy the monumental soundtrack. Number three. Okay, I'm cheating a little bit on this one because I just want to say the entire series. Every game I've played of this franchise is fantastic, especially in the music department. For a well-known series that has been around since 1992, 28 years old, I am appalled at how little traction the Kirby soundtrack gains. Maybe it's just me, let me know comment section, but I don't hear many people singing praise of Kirby soundtracks. Jun Ishikawa is one of the main composers of the Kirby series and is responsible for composing many of the iconic Kirby songs. DDD's theme, Floats Islands, and Green Greens. His musical strengths are sprightly and electronic-based work. It's also incredible how other musicians rearrange his work over the years, each keeping the same spirit but different sound. And this brings me to the game I'd like to highlight, Kirby's epic or extra epic yarn. The lead composer on this bad boy in junction with June is Tomoya Tomita, also responsible for Yoshi's Woolly World games. From all the Kirby games that I've played, epic yarn takes the cake in the music department. It's so distinct, calming, and joyful. Most Kirby games are upbeat and fast paced, but Tomoya took it slow, which allowed him to compose something unheard of in Kirby titles. I found a fantastic interview with Tomoya that I'll link in the description detailing his inspirations. Funny enough, Prince Fluff was the protagonist before this rightfully became a Kirby game late in development, so Kirby didn't even come to mind. Director Madoka Yamauchi explained that she wanted a game that little kids could play with their mothers. So rather than compose for a game, I envisioned writing music for a picture book, and he centered his compositions around a single acoustic instrument, and ultimately decided on the piano, because of the variety afforded by its impressive range of tones and dynamics. And when he said picture book, it all kind of clicked. There's even a narrator who expressively reads the opening as if his audience are children. Sorcerer appeared. My name is... Hey, what are you doing? I'm also really glad he chose the piano because he really demonstrated what the instrument is capable of. This theme is lighthearted and blithe. It honestly sets the tone. But on the other hand, we have the theme verse Meta Knight, where the piano sounds chaotic, corrupted, and menacing. It's magical how the very same piano that ensnares the player with peace and glee could also sound threatening. Again, I haven't played all the Kirby games, but I would absolutely argue that this is the best or at the very least the most distinct Kirby titles musically. And unfortunately, it's slept on. Number two. As a gamer, we're all used to playing different roles. I've been a dragon. I've been a dragon slayer. I've been the hero. I've been the villain. I've been a witch. And I've been a bitch. Every adventure you take, every virtual world you immerse yourself in, is set up to be exciting and fun. Like another life, we live vicariously through our 2D and 3D avatars, and through times like this, it's hard to say no to that. But there are games, instead of taking on the grandiose role of a valiant champion or a villainous mastermind, we're invited to play the extraordinary challenges of a seemingly ordinary occupation. Another series rather than a singular game, Ace Attorney and we're sticking with the main entries. You know, I know so many gamers who praise this game, myself included, but rarely is the music ever a talking point, and I don't know why. I'd argue Ace Attorney is so good that the Pursuit theme, while not as popular as the Mario theme or the Hyrule Field theme, 
is an anthem in gaming. Even if you don't play the Ace Attorney series, people in the casual gaming community would know where it's from. And how it evolved with the series from soul igniting chiptune beats to fully orchestrated bangers that are impossible to object to. Each BGM is suited to each section of your playthrough. Take the very first game's court lounge theme, for example. A medley of synths, a consistent kick with a smooth peppering of hi-hat flourish between refrains. It's the first of a few songs from Phoenix Wright's gaming debut that wouldn't sound so out of place on an 80s synth pop playlist. The attention to weaving the emotion of the player's progress through their trial is admirable as well, as the cross-examination themes throughout the series have two tempos. Moderato, which is basically Italian for chill pace, and Allegro, which is when you're making a breakthrough as an attorney. And this isn't to say the one-off songs aren't good either. Character themes, the song that play after you secure justice, or during the court lounge pep talks. All of it adds to the atmosphere and lends themselves immaculately to immersion. What's magical about Ace Attorney is not only the crazy cases, but how the music emboldens them. The first Ace Attorney game and Apollo Justice seem to be my favorite in this regard. I also find myself more partial to the 16-bit chiptune soundtracks of the preceding games than the live orchestral sound of the more recent releases. But to be clear, neither is bad. Number one. This game right here was monumentous to my childhood. Don't get me wrong, I love my Sonic, Zelda, Mario, and my Pokemans, but this game was my everything. I listen to the soundtrack practically daily. It might be a hidden gem, but it sure as hell is forgotten about, and in the music department, oh forget it, it's totally overlooked. I'm talking the mystical and the magical game 1996's Nights Into Dreams. Such a forgotten gem, both as a game and its outstanding, beautiful, perfect, bouncy, spellbinding, exceptional soundtrack. We praise musicians Naofumi Hayata and Tomoko Sayaki and Fumi Kumatani for their work as composers for this game. This is the hardest part to explain because I just want to scream that everything's good. Every level has this welcoming, vivacious beat, and also it matches the level with this fantastic choice of thematic instruments, like other games on this list and the previous videos do. For example, one of the level themes that has persistently reigned as one of my favorite songs throughout the years is Mystic Forest. Or Soft Museum. The world kind of warps around nights, it bounces them around, and it's so whimsical and uplifting like you're having a fun and happy day at the museum. And after completing a level, you're met with such a stark contrast in music as you prepare to face the boss. The boss music is easily where this game shines brightest for me. They kill it. Jackal is the boss fight for the Soft Museum. He's a piece of shit, bodiless nightmare who has the coolest bass and saxophone solo I've ever heard. And finally, let's talk about Dreams Dreams, the ending theme. There is so much celebratory joy, it's hard to leave the song feeling anything less than happy. The vocal duet of the child version gives this heartfelt sweet timbre, an innocent love song that, while may not be as expertly executed vocally as the adult version, really captures youth adoration. The 
The adult version soulfully expresses that romantic affection with just as much heartwarming wholesomeness. But the chorus, especially the lyrics, featuring adult vocalists always bring it to that kind of transcendent harmony that you can only hear from classic R&B or gospel hits. You're not far away, anytime, anyplace, I can see your face. You're that special one that I've been waiting for, and I hope you're looking for someone like me. If there was ever a song that should have hit billboards in the era it came from, Dreams Dreams is it. And there's even an acapella version. Oh my god, I, I gotta stop. I can go on forever. There's so much inside. And there you have it, my top five underrated gaming soundtracks, excluding JRPGs. Anywho, I would love to know some of your favorite underrated gaming soundtracks, excluding JRPGs. I hope you guys enjoyed this video because it was so hard to make. Your girl got writer's block. Special thanks to my script editor and borderline script writer in some places, to Kai. To give you an idea of my writer's block, when I was writing Ace Attorney, I was like, I like the dings and pings. I could not think of the word chiptune. I also want to say a special thank you to Ivy who gifted me House Laboratories, House of Whiskey, Makeup Palette. I love it. That's what this look is. I hope you're feeling it. And speaking of feeling it, I really hope you are enjoying Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. You definitely can expect a review sometime in the near future. The Minado. It can see the future. That was so bad. <laughs> I'll probably edit that out. Anyway, until next time, toodaloo. Thank you so much for watching, lovelies. Top box for more videos like this, and the bottom box is a video I did with John Cartwright and Ash Paulson called What's That Track? JRPG Edition. Check it out, it was a lot of fun, and I will see you in the next video. I can see your faces. You're that special one that I've been waiting.